Uh, wise decisions and uh, the government, the Australian government, uh, their management consultancy fees for the year 2016-2017 is almost a staggering $700 million that they paid in consultancy fees. Now, now councillors have always been part of, 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 the, of any kingdom, of any ruler, or any government because it's, it's uh, uh, well, it's commonly not expected for one man to be knowledgeable in all areas of, of government and therefore you need your trusted advisors, you need your trusted counselors. And, and so throughout scripture we read often of, of advisors and counselors to, to kings. I mean, King David had two counselors. One, his name is Ahithophel and the other one is Hushai. Now, Ahithophel's counsel was so valuable that it was said that if you inquire from him, it was in like in receiving from the word of God. Uh, we read in in 2 Samuel 16, verse 33. And so, so wise counselors were exceedingly uh, valuable and important, ones that you can trust. Uh, of course, we read also of others like Rehoboam, the son of Solomon, who refused uh, the counsel of his father's counselors in favor of the counsel of his mates, which ultimately resulted in the kingdom being divided into the northern and southern kingdoms. Uh, also, Scripture uh, exhorts us to to seek counsel and to, and to follow the counsel of wise and godly people, especially the book of Proverbs, are just filled with, with exhortations for us to heed what our parents are saying to us, to heed what wise men would be saying to us, to heed what elders and spiritual leaders, those who are well-versed in the, in the wisdom of the Lord, can, can bring to us. Uh, Wisdom, of course, which is the Lord, and the Lord is, is Isaiah called earlier him in, 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 in Isaiah 9 verse 6 that, that he is called, his name is called the Wonderful Counselor, and that he would be endowed with the spirit of, of counsel and, and strength, uh, Isaiah eleven twenty six tells us. And so we also know that us, after the uh, Christ's earthly ministry that he promised to send his helper, the teacher, the spirit of truth, who would guide us into all truth. And so for New Testament believers, we have the, the privilege privilege of having the Spirit residing in us and who is our counselor, reminding us of the Word of God. Uh, and this morning we are back in uh, our beloved Gospel of Isaiah. Uh, we are in chapter 3, uh, and in this, uh, not chapter 3, sorry, chapter 30, uh, I saw some of you lost hope there for a moment, uh, <laughs> chapter 30, uh, that uh, and in this passage we, we find uh, basically an admonition and also an exhortation, uh, a warning and an encouragement. And really, it's it's a the warning is to beware of being unfaithful to the Lord, and and the encouragement is to believe that the Lord is faithful. Uh, and so just, just to, again to remind us, we've been sometime since we've been in Isaiah, to remind you of the quick historical setting of, 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 uh, where we, of our passage in chapter 30. It, it is within the section called the Book of Woes, which is from chapter 28 to chapter 35. And really a woe is a declaration or an, or an oracle or a warning of impending doom or, or judgment because of um, the guilty being, being guilty of a certain actions which which God does not approve of. And so in this book of woes, we find six oracles directed against Judah for failing to trust in God, refusing to listen to him, refusing to believe and to act on his word. And just the political background of these chapters, you may remember Assyria was the rising world power of that day, uh, was aggressively expanding its, its territory and its influence, and all the countries in the Middle Eastern area were seeking alliances with each other in order to protect themselves against the advances of the Assyrian Empire. And so King Ahaz of Judah... We read of him in chapter 7 to 12, uh, really king no faith. He was, um, 
um, really attacked by the Northern Alliance, which is made up of Israel and, and Aram, which is modern-day Syria. Why? Because he refused to join them in an alliance against Assyria. And so because he refused, they wanted to depose him, and so they made war against him. And Ahaz, inst- instead of turning to the Lord as instructed by uh, Isaiah to trust in the Lord for deliverance, he went and made an alliance with the enemy, the devil himself, which was Assyria of that day. And so uh, we read that, that uh, later on, uh, Assyria actually did attack the northern alliance, that is Israel and Aram, and overpowered them and exiled them uh, in 722 BC. And so when Hezekiah became king after King Ahaz, uh, uh, king over Judah, he broke the alliance with Assyria, which resulted in Assyria putting a target back on Judah. Uh, for, for what they would see as rebellion against them. And now Hezekiah in, in Scripture is described as a, as a good king. In fact, he is described as that there was no one of the king of Judah, the kings of Judah, either before him or after him, who sought and who trust the Lord more perfectly than he did, which is quite an amazing statement given the company, if you can remember, of King David and King Solomon and other kings who were, who were faithful to the Lord. Maybe it just refers First to uh, the kings after the division of of, uh, of uh, the, the the kingdom into the northern southern period. But anyway, uh, King Hezekiah was was a good king and he broke the allegiance with Assyria. But then on uh, advice, probably from his advisors, his counselors, sought help from, first of all, King Merodach Baladan, who was the king of Babylon. Uh, and so they try, tried to rely on, on that uh, alliance until he was deposed, that was Merodach Baladan, by the Assyrians. And so instead of turning to the Lord, the counselors advise uh, Hezekiah again to seek an alliance with Egypt to rely on them instead of heeding the message that has been consistent and persistently preached by Isaiah, and that is to trust in the Lord. Believe His word. He will deliver you from Assyria. And so we read in these woes, these woe oracles in chapter 28, the first woe was against those leaders of Judah who really disregarded the word of God and they mocked the word of God and they mocked Isaiah saying that the message was as simple as baby talk and that he was basically babbling like a baby. Um, And God responded with, well, if you hear the word of God sounding as a foreign language, then know this is a sign of judgment that is to come upon you. Something which Paul picks up in Corinthians, 1 Corinthians 14, when he explains to the Corinthians that the gift of tongues was a sign for the unbeliever. A sign of judgment to the unbelieving Jews who refused Christ, who did not refuse the revelation of Christ. Then chapter 29, we have the second and the third woe oracles directed against the formalism of Judah. They were just going through the motions in their worship. They were just offering their their sacrifices, but their hearts were not in it. And, uh, And God warned them that they, Jerusalem, would be an aerial to him, which when an aerial we said was was a fire hearth, uh, uh, basically an altar on which uh, sacrifices was offered unto God and where God's wrath was really satisfied. So this was really a, a, an announcement of judgment. Jerusalem, you will be a fire hearth. I will pour out my wrath on you and it will be satisfied with me being being a uh, in, in judgment of you. And then also an, an, an oracle against their foolishness, um, thinking, or the leaders of that day, thinking that they can make plans and hide it from God. Uh, absolute foolishness and futility. And so the wonderful thing, actually, just on a side note of these uh, oracles, is that after each of these woe oracles, there also was a word of hope that after God announced impending doom and judgment, He also reminds them every time of that He is for them, that He seeks to restore them. He, seeks to, he has plans for them, plans to, of peace, plans of prosperity. And so we come in chapter 30 to, to the, 
fourth woe oracle. Uh, and it says there in verse 1, Woe to the rebellious children. And before we go into that, let me just pray for us. Uh, great Father, we thank you, Lord, for your revelation to us. Lord, thank you that you've given us your word, that you have preserved your word through, through the ages. And we know, Lord, that, that your word will stand forever. And Lord, that we can trust your word, that we can rely on what you have said, because you are a God of truth. And so, Lord, help us this morning as we, again, read from your word that you would speak to us lord each one of us where we're at lord you know our hearts i pray that your spirit would would apply the word of god to each of our hearts and lord that we will be confronted lord that we would be cautioned lord that we would be called to repentance lord that we would be comforted by your word this morning, I pray, and in Jesus' name, amen. And so Isaiah chapter 30, and really the, the first part of, of, of this section, verses 1 to 17, is really the warning, um, the admonition, and that's, that is to beware of being unfaithful to God like Judah was. And let me just read for us. Woe to the rebellious children, declares the Lord, who executes a plan but not mine, and makes an alliance but not of my spirit, in order to add sin to sin, who proceed down to Egypt without consulting me, to take refuge in the safety of Pharaoh, and to seek shelter in the shadow of Egypt. Therefore, the safety of Pharaoh will be your shame. And the shelter of, uh, in the shadow of Egypt, your humiliation. For their princes are at Zoan, and their ambassadors arrive at Hanes. Everyone will be ashamed because of a people who cannot profit them, who are not for help or profit, but for shame and also for reproach. And the oracle concerning the beast of the Negev through a land of distress and anguish from where came um, a lioness and lion, a viper and flying serpent. They carry their riches on their backs of young, on the backs of young donkeys and their treasures on camels' humps to a people who cannot profit them. Even Egypt, whose help is vain and empty. Therefore, I have called her Rahab who has been exterminated. Well, let's just read to there for now. Uh, and so here, uh, the Lord calls those in, in Judah rebellious children. He says, woe to those who are stubborn, who are rebellious, who are unwilling to change their ways, unwilling to, to follow His will and His ways, but persist on following their own, self-reliant and independent. And really, rebellious is, is anyone who ignores the Word of God. Uh, and this, this was revealed repeatedly through Isaiah, uh, commanding, urging Judah to trust in the Lord for their salvation from Assyria. But they made their own plans. They, they wanted an alliance with Egypt. They, they made a plan, but it was not from God's Spirit. They were, did not consult Him. This was a plan built on human wisdom. They sought to take refuge in the safety of Pharaoh, in the shelter of the shadow of Egypt, instead of under the wings of the Almighty God. And really, not seeking God... Not consulting God is always shameful and stupid. And that's what, what, what we see in this passage. Really, in, in, in verses 3 to 5, three times the word shame is used. It's shameful that the people of God would seek protection from the world in open rebellion against the counsel of God on this matter. For he already decreed that Assyria will wipe out the northern kingdom that he will chastise Judah, but will not, uh, Assyria will not completely overpower Judah, but he, for he will deliver them from the Assyrians, but, and they were to trust in him. He already told them that repeatedly. And yet they sent this di diplomatic delegation, their princes, uh, who was at that time when, when Isaiah gave the message in Zoan and Hanes, which were cities in the, in the Nile Delta region of, of Egypt. 
And we're saying that this will only result in shame on you because you are going to people that will fail you, that cannot help you and will not help you. They cannot profit you. Why do you turn to them? Turn to me, is the call. And so going against the revealed will of God will always leave you really with egg on your face. And, and you will eat some humble pie in some, uh, at some stage if you refuse the counsel of the Lord. And so it's not only shameful to do that, but it's also stupid. We read in verses 6 and 7 about the arduous and dangerous journey that they took. Arduous because the land of Negev was, was dry. It was a desert region uh, full of, of, of hardship and, and, and probably robbers and raiders. It was also very dangerous because of the animals that populated that area, lions and lionesses and, and vipers and flying serpents that will prey upon the unexpected and the unfortunate. But there's, a, there's another element which, of, of their shameful stupidity which I think was not totally lost on the recipients of this message. Because the shortest way from Israel to Egypt was to go through Philistine the coastal plain of, of, the, of the Philistines. But they chose the route of going through Negev and in some way directly retraced the steps that they took when God brought them out of Egypt during the Exodus. And so in one way, God is saying to you, you are, you are following, you are in one sense refusing me, the one who redeemed you, and you are returning to the world for your help. You would risk your, your wealth and your health by taking this route to seek help from the world when you have God on your side, when you have God who wants to help you. Absolute stupidity. And God is, in a sense, mocking their stupidity. He called Egypt Rahab, who was exterminated. The Hebrew is Rahab Chem Shebeth, which really, the, the Rahab uh, is, is, not, is not Rahab that you may think of, uh, of, of the city of Jericho when Joshua and, and, and uh, Israel was surrounding that. Uh, this is a different word that is used. This word means really sea monster, uh, most, most likely crocodile in this sense, because it, it also was a name that was given to Egypt, a nickname of Egypt, uh, the land of the crocodile, because of all the, uh, the crocodiles there in the Nile. And it also, it also can mean uh, strength or, or arrogance. And so that is what Rahab means. And Hem Shabbat means really to sit idle or to do nothing. And so the idea here is, is that Egypt had the reputation of strength, but not the ability to exercise it. That they were all talk and no action. And as one commentator said, which I really enjoyed, he says, Egypt was nothing more than, than a big mouth do nothing. That is all talk and, and, and no action. That they will not be able to help you, although they puff themselves up and believe their own press. And so Isaiah was instructed to write that down to, on a tablet, to write, inscribe it on a scroll. Big mouth do nothing. Uh, as, a, as a witness, really, to, to, to the leaders of Judah who forsook the Almighty God in favor of, of impotent Egypt, in favor of a has-been, a big mouth do nothing. But it is really the verses 9 to 12 which, which are really shocking because he describes to us the, the depth of their unfaithfulness. Uh, the, the, it reveals the, the depth of their rebellion, their distrust, their disdain of God and his counsel. Because we read that uh, uh, verse 8 Sorry, now go, uh, sorry, verse 9. For this is the rebellious people, false sons, sons who refuse to listen to the instruction of the Lord, who says to the seers, you must not see visions, and to the prophets, you must not prophesy to us what is right. Speak to us pleasant words. Prophesy illusions. Get out of the way. Turn aside from the path. Let us hear no more about the Holy One of Israel. 
Therefore, thus says the Holy One of Israel, since you have rejected this word and you have put your trust in oppression in guile and have relied on them, therefore this iniquity will be to you like a breach about to fall, a bulge in a high wall whose collapse comes suddenly in an instant which collapses like a smashing of a, of a potter's jar, so ruthlessly shattered that a shirt will not be found among its pieces to take fire from the earth or to scoop water from a cistern. Strong words of, of judgment, but, but judgment because of their attitude towards God and His Word. They were rightly called rebellious and false sons. For they did not speak and they did not act as those who had God as their Redeemer, as those who had God as their Father, for they scorned His Word, commanding the seers and the prophets to stop telling us what God says. We don't want to hear that. Tell us, don't tell us what is right, what we should hear. Tell us what we want to hear. Flatter us, comfort us, soothe us. And so, man of God, if you don't have anything nice to say, anything uplifting, that would be what we want to hear, then shut up, away with you, stop preaching, and away with the Holy One of Israel. We will make our own decisions. We will follow our own way because we know better. Incredible words come from the people of God. That they would stoop so low. But like a true prophet, like a true faithful man of God, like any true child of God who proclaims the word of God and who ultimately answers to him alone, who called him and commissioned him, when anyone tells you to shut up, don't say what God says, then follow Isaiah's example. You don't want to hear from the Holy One of Israel. Thus says the Holy One of Israel. We can only speak what God gives us to speak. And when you speak what God gives you to speak, that's when you stand on truth. And so Isaiah pronounced a judgment on them. You who reject the word of God, his will and his ways in favor of your own, the way of oppression and guile. Really oppression was, you may remember back in Isaiah 22 when, when they were tearing down houses to, to build up the wall, to strengthen the walls of, of the city. Now obviously that was not always seemingly done on a voluntary basis. It would, it would, um, one would think, and, and guile was just their deception. Uh, their, their devious and crooked plans and ways that they followed, saying one thing and then doing another. And he says, well, the Holy One of Israel tells you that this sin, this rejection of my word will be to you like a, a high wall that has a sort of has a crack on it and it bulges and suddenly collapses on you and will totally smash you. It will ruthlessly shatter you. So much so that there's not even a shard left. The picture is of, a, of that uh, potter's uh, uh, a clay pot, a jar that is shattered to the extent that you cannot even pick up a shard to scrape some coals together or to even to scoop out some water to drink from a cistern. Completely crushed. When God allows the circumstances of their deliberate rejection of the word to come upon them, the fact that they have purposely disregarded him, the consequences of that is ruthless. It's severe. It is shattering. And yet we read in verse 15, For thus says the Lord, the Holy One of Israel, 
Yes, in repentance and rest you will be saved. In quietness and trust is your strength. But you were not willing. Ezekiel say, say the same thing. It's like uh, he, God has to have no pleasure in the death of, 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 of the wicked, of anyone. But he seeks people to repent and to live, Ezekiel 18, 32. And, that, and that's God's desire for them. Uh, he, he pronounces judgment to, to them so that they would understand the consequences of their sins. Why? So that they would repent and return and trust in Him, rest in Him. In quietness and in trust will be your strength. You will be able to withstand the onslaught of the Assyrian army, not because of your reliance on Egypt, but because of your reliance on God. Your strengths come from your faith in the Lord, not fretting about the uncontrollable issues in your life comes from your trust in the Holy One of Israel. Trust in His Word. Trust in His ability. Trust in His strength, His wisdom, His faithfulness to fulfill His plans and purposes. But they were not willing. They said no to God. They refused to accept and embrace His Word. Instead, verses 16 and 17, And you said, No, for we will flee on horses, therefore you shall flee. And we will ride on swift horses, therefore those who pursue you shall be swift. One thousand will flee at the threat of one man. You will flee at the threat of five until you are left as a flag on a mountaintop and as a signal on a hill. Instead of repenting, instead of putting their trust in the Lord, they wanted to flee on horses. And this is not f trying to flee away from Assyria. This was, the horses was, was, a, was, was used as a symbol of military might. They wanted to flee to trust in horses. He said, well, you want, you want, you want to trust in, in swift horses? Well, your enemy will have faster horses, bigger horses, stronger horses. They will overpower you. You want to run away quickly? Well, they will be faster than you. And that would leave you weak and cowardly where a thousand of you will flee at the sight of one man and all of you will flee at the sight of five men. And you will, your humiliation will be a, as a flag, as a signal on a hill for all to see that it is folly to trust in man, in human wisdom, in man's, man's ability, in military strength and not in the Lord. And the Lord often does that when, when He uses the very thing in which we place our trust really to expose the folly of us trusting in that thing. So you may trust in money or in possessions or wealth, then He will teach you how flighty that is, how unreliable that is. If you trust in, in someone, another person, and not in Him, then He will show you how fickle and feeble people are. They will fail you every time because even the greatest of men have clay feet. Only God is strong. You may trust in your intellect or your, your reasoning capabilities. Well, He will use wisdom and your reasoning to expose the futility of human understanding. Look to Him. And all of this to say, woe, to those who do not consult the Lord, of those who act unfaithfully to the Lord and, do, and go against His counsel. And really the question for us is, what about us? What about you and me? Are we guilty of this? Do we go to the Lord? When we have to make decisions, when we are planning for the future, do we first seek the Lord? And I'm sure we will all say, yeah, 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 no, I prayed about it. And then I got this warm assurance, feeling of peace in me. That may be well the peace that your own desires is creating in you. Have you searched the scriptures? I mean, what, what was available to Judah? What should they have done? Well, they could have consulted 
uh, the previously recorded prophecies that was available to them, what Isaiah had given them, all the plans and promises of God that was clearly stipulated to them, they could have consulted that. Or they could have gone to the priest, the priest who could uh, consult the Lord through the Urim and, and the Thummim. Uh, these were stones that they were used to discern the will of God as, as instructed to them in the Pentateuch. Or they could go to the prophets themselves and say, please consult the Lord for us on, on, on this behalf. What does the Lord say on this? But they choose not to. And so what about us today? How do we consult the Lord? Do we consult the Lord? We who have direct access to the Father through, through Christ in prayer, pray, do we pray through a decision, not just about a decision? Praying through a decision is you take every aspect of it and you lay it before the Lord. Lord, what about this? What about this? Help, help me understand what is your will in each of these aspects? Not just pray, oh yeah, Lord, bless, bless, bless what I've already decided. That's not praying about a decision. We have the Word of God, the full and complete revelation of God. Really, as Paul says, we have the mind of Christ available to us. Do we consult Him in our decisions? We have the Spirit of truth resident in us who will lead us in all truth and reminds us of the Word of God. And some of us may have family, godly family, those who are in Christ who can be consulted. We have godly friends, those who are mature in their walk with the Lord. We have the church, brothers and sisters in Christ. We have pastors and elders appointed really to help us to, to, to find the direction of God in our lives, to give oversight and to help us discern, to make wise, godly decisions. Not just affirming what you've already decided. That's not seeking counsel. And the Bible encourages us to seek counsel repeatedly. Proverbs 12, 15. The way of a fool is right in his own eyes, but a wise man is he who listens to counsel. Proverbs 14, 11, uh, sorry, 11, 14. Uh, there, where there's no guidance, the people fall, but in abundance of counselors, there is victory. Proverbs 15, 22, without consultation, plans are frustrated, but with many counselors, they succeed. And then a warning, Proverbs 18, 1, he who separates himself seeks his own desire. He quarrels against all sound wisdom. Those who seek no counsel seek, seek to isolate themselves, not to ask for help and so beware of isolating yourself say I know what is best for me so I, and I, I don't really want anyone else to tell me otherwise and so you either don't consult the Lord or you don't seek counsel from others or you only seek counsel from those who would agree with you or you keep seeking counsel until you find someone who agrees with you. And, we, and we, we're smiling about that because you've done it, I know. It takes humility and faith to seek counsel from the Lord through His people. And even, even, even corporately, even, even as a church, this, this has direct application to us. That we would never stop preaching the Word of God. Uh, there's so much pressure in, in churches, and thank God not in this church, for people to say, Pastor, just don't give us the Word. Tell us something nice. Build us up. Make us feel happy. Life is hard enough. Tickle our ears a bit. Well, many churches have made plans and have executed plans to extend and expand their ministry, but they are not the Lord's plans because they were based on, on, on human pragmatism and not on doctrine and theology and the Word of God. 
Those are not plans of God's Spirit. And I pray that we would never abandon as, as a church the centrality of God's Word, that we will never abandon our dependency on the Spirit of God, that we will never stop our fervency in prayer for God's people and for His glory. And that we will be found to be faithful in the preaching of God's Word, whether that's in season or out of season, when it's easy or when it's difficult, when, when people want to hear it or don't want to hear it. When they say, stop speaking in the name of the Lord, we will respond, this is the word of the, God, the Lord, this is His way, thus says the Lord. And we can say no, nothing else. May we never forsake the equipping of the saints for ministry, to proclaim Christ to all and all mature in Christ, to love and serve others and to do good to all people and especially to those of the household of faith so that we will raise up wise counselors, godly counselors, people that can encourage and help each other, not from their own opinion, but from the Word of God. That is what makes for a strong, God-glorifying church. When we have our eyes on Him. Because as soon as we take our eyes off Him, guess what? We put it on something else. And then end up consulting the world instead of the creator of the world. And so it's my constant prayer that we would be faithful to the Lord. Second Timothy says it's a trustworthy statement. If we died with him, we will also live with him. If we endure, we will also reign with him. If we deny him, he will also deny us. If we are faithless, he remains faithful, for he cannot deny himself. And that's the the hope that we have that even though we will be at times unfaithful to the Lord, that He is never unfaithful. He is always faithful because He cannot deny who He is. And so let us exhort one another to believe in the faithfulness of God. Verses 18 through to, to 33 we see that He is faithful to bless His people, that God is a, a gracious God, a compassionate God. That is His nature. That's His character. And it's always been His plan for Judah and for His people, I would say, for His church today, and that is to be gracious to us. And though Judah had forsaken Him, they have turned away from Him. He longed for, He waits on high to have compassion on them. He wants to act with favor towards them, favor which they have not earned and do not deserve. And so he waits to be gracious to them, to show them compassion. But, but why wait is the answer, is the question. Well, verse 19 gives us the answer. It says so that people will cry out to him. He waited for them to return to Him, to repent from their trust in Egypt, from their rebellion, and, uh, and, and return back to Him. Because you see, while people are in active rebellion, they cannot understand God's compassion. They will not receive God's compassion. They will refuse His grace. They will misinterpret and misapply God's kindness to them until they have learned justice, until they have learned what is the consequences of their sin. That's when they will understand mercy and the compassion that God wants to show them. Because God is a God of grace. But verse 18 also tells us that He is a God of justice. And for people to understand His grace, they first need to understand His justice. 
For us to fully appreciate grace, we have to fully appreciate justice. And so he chastened them for their waywardness. He dis- disciplined them for their, for their rebellion. God allowed hardship and suffering to come upon them, upon the people of Zion, the inhabitants of Jerusalem, to make them turn to Him, to make them cry to them so that He can be gracious to them. And so He gave them the bread of privation and the water of oppression. These are just euphemisms for, for hardship. And, 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 and historically, he did not immediately remove the, the threat of the Assyrians, but allowed the Assyrians to come and, and really ran through Israel, exiled them, and, and through most of Judah. Actually, 46 walled cities of Judah was destroyed, and over 200,000 people were taken captive. Jerusalem he preserved as he promised. And so for us to understand grace, one has to understand justice. And and God's plans and purposes for your life and my life do not change when He allows hardship to come into our lives. But He wants us to turn to Him, to call to Him, to cling to Him, to trust in Him. Even though we can't see the way forward, even though we can't see the end, we all want to see, if only I could see the end, then I can trust the Lord through this. No, no, trust Him even when you can't see the end, when you don't know what the outcome would be. That is faith. And so He gave them hardship and suffering to accomplish two things. First was to break the hardness of their heart, to crush the rebellion of their spirit, and so that they will turn back to Him, to call to Him, and so that He can show His grace to them. That blows my mind. And secondly, He wants to make them more sensitive to His Word, for them to incline their ears and their hearts to follow His will and His ways, as taught by His Word. Verse 20 Although the Lord has given you bread of privation and water of oppression, He, your teacher, will no longer hide Himself, but your eyes will behold your teacher. Your ears will hear a word behind you. This is the way, walk in it. Wherever you turn, to the right or to the left. Now there's a, there's a little bit of a difficulty in, these, in this verse. Uh, I think the, the New American Standard... Bible and the English Standard Version translated as singular, your teacher uh, will no longer hide himself, while the New King James and the NIV translated as teachers, plural. And that's because in the Hebrew, uh, the word is in the plural. It is, it is teachers. Your teachers will no longer, should read, will no longer hide themselves. But in the Hebrew, it actually reads, will no longer hide himself, singular again. So which one is it? Is it, is it teacher or teacher? Is it himself or themselves? And uh, I, I, I think, I mean, if it is teachers, then it will mean that, that those whom the Lord has sent, that they would no longer be afraid of any persecution that may come, and they will freely teach the Word of, word of God. And they will see them, uh, and uh, they would no, no longer need to, to hide uh, themselves. Uh, but if it is teacher, then, uh, then this is a reference to, to Christ, uh, to the great teacher. And, and, I, and I probably lean towards that understanding, uh, really just because of the, the context that follows that verse. Uh, so I would, I would understand that, that as, as, as this is the teacher of, of Israel, the great teacher of Israel, who ultimately taught his people through his teachers that he sent, through, through his prophets and, 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 and uh, priests and in and, 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 and the New Testament, his apostles and his pastor teachers. And these are those who, who the Lord has sent, the great teacher teaching through them his word. Uh, and then at a time, uh, at that time when, when they, when they will, will turn back, when they come, become repentant, uh, they will listen and follow the direction of the Lord as revealed by His Word, the voice that they will hear behind you. Uh, now, some, some may 
think that that is a reference even to the Holy Spirit that, that was to pour out. Uh, this is hard to, dis to discern that from, from this passage. Uh, and so my view is, is I think this is a reference. It should be uh, teacher singular. You will, uh, let me just go. Uh, he, your teacher, will no longer hide himself, but your eyes will behold your teacher. And uh, your ears will hear a word behind you. This is the way, walk in it, wherever you turn to the right or, or to the left. And, and so when they, when they come and, 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 and receive the word of God from, from the teacher of Jerusalem, the one who would ultimately come and when he has established his kingdom will be in Jerusalem teaching the nations as we have seen in Isaiah 2, verse 2 to 4, that he is the teacher of, of, of the nation and of Israel. And when, and when they when they receive their teacher, when they actually heed his word, they will finally turn away from their idols. Following the next verses, uh, idols which have plagued the people of Israel throughout the ages, they will finally renounce them all and look to the Lord alone. And then they will walk in obedience to him, and he will restore to them and bestow on them all the blessings of his kingdom. Really, we see that there will be an abundance of, of, of crops. It will be rich and plenteous. Uh, there will be an abundance of livestock. There will be fat and useful. There will be an abundance of water. Multiple of streams will flow in the hills. And I think this will all find its full fulfillment on, uh, in the earthly kingdom of Christ. Because we read that he will come and he will, he will judge the nations. Uh, and so the abundant waters will flow in its fullness on the day when the Lord destroys all the enemies of Israel. And this is a reference, of course, to the future, the second coming. It talks about the towers that will fall. A tower is a symbol of, 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 of power and, and rule. And then he goes on and he describes these cosmic changes that will happen. That the, when, when the Lord finally heals his people when he binds up their fracture and, and heals the bruise that he has caused them in order for them to turn back to him. Now, verse 26, I think would probably any climate advocates or climate change advocates worst nightmare um, because we read that, that the moon will be as bright as the sun and the sun will be seven times brighter. And now, that would scorch the earth uh, beyond any means of sustaining life on the earth. And yet we know that it will be a time of great abundance and blessing. So, so how are we to understand this? Well, again, two, two ways. One is, is uh, possibly this is just describing a way that, that, that the light at that time would be at the optimal for, for productivity. That's one way. Or that it can be a reference back earlier in Isaiah 4, uh, uh, verse 5 and 6 talks about a canopy that will be uh, over Jerusalem and, and, and that, that will protect it from the fierce heat, uh, referring also back to the days of, of his second coming. Uh, but regardless, there will be major cosmic changes that will accompany the Lord's second coming and his presence on earth. But all of these things is to set to, 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 to ensure them that God is faithful to his promises. What he has said he will do. And then to prove that, he announces to them the judgment on his enemies, on their enemies, Assyria, which was the immediate threat to them. And having assured Judah that, that uh, the Lord's attitude towards them is, is one that he wants to show them grace and, and restore them and bless them, he now turns his attention, really verses 27 to 33, uh, about judging and punishing Assyria, their enemies, in, in really vivid and frightening terms. He says there that, Behold, the name of the Lord comes from a remote place. The name is really the fullness of His revelation. All of who God is will come and, and be against. His anger will burn. His anger is described as a, as a consuming fire, a consuming flame. And Assyria was God's chosen instrument of judgment against Samaria, and, uh, which is the northern tribes, Israel and, and, and Aram, the northern alliance. 
And we read earlier in that, that they would come down through the northern tribes through Israel and flow into Judah and, and it's almost described as a flood coming up to the neck of Judah and, uh, chapters chapters 8 and 10 if you can refer back to that but here God's judgment on Assyria is described as similar as this mighty torrent which will come up to their necks and will all but completely destroy them God will make his judgment known, his voice of authority, his decrees will be fulfilled in flame and fire and cloudburst and a downpour and of hailstones. All pictures of his wrath that we see further pointing to his judgment even to the end of the age in, in Revelations 8. And so he will utterly crush Assyria with the rod of his punishment and the bodies of the slain will be burned in the fire of Topheth which was a place in the Kidron Valley just next to Jerusalem where they sometimes offered children to that hideous Canaanite deity Molech. And this time the defeated Assyrians will be burned on fire, kindled by the breath of God. They're all very powerful, very vivid language depicting the fierceness and the gravity and the reality of God's judgment. So that God is a God of grace, but He's also a God of justice of judgment and when when it happens Judah will experience great joy and will have uh, great festivities reminiscent of um, their festivals that they were commanded to to keep three times a year uh, and in history that happens that happened when the Lord slain 185,000 Assyrian soldiers outside Jerusalem without anyone in Judah having to raise a hand in battle. The Lord is faithful. The Lord is truthful. What he says he will do. And that would be a good thing for us to remember today as we reflect on, on this message that was given so many years ago to Judah that the Lord is faithful and we need to beware that we should not be unfaithful to Him. And He calls us to walk by faith. He calls us to walk by His Word, to walk by His Spirit. And so perhaps the Lord has come confronted you today because you have been making plans having rejected his counsel, having not consulted his counsel. And he maybe cautions you against that. Don't make any plans without consulting him, without seeking him, without consulting his word or his people. Or perhaps he calls you to repentance because you have made plans without consulting him. You are in the process of executing those plans. You are trusting in something other than the Lord. And he calls you, no, it's in quietness. And in rest, or trust that you will find your strength. Or maybe he's, he's comforted you today. That you again needed to hear that he is the God of grace. And that he is the God of justice. And that he is faithful. And so if God has spoken to you this morning, then take time to sit and reflect. And for, for those who are in Christ, who believes, He calls us to be faithful. He reminds us that He wants to be gracious to us. And for those who are, have not turned to Christ, who do not believe, He reminds you that He is a God of judgment. And he calls you to repentance. I pray that we would all heed the word of the Lord this morning. Let me pray for us. Father, we thank you, Lord, for reminding us of your truth. Lord, we, we have to confess, Lord, that often we make decisions. We just, in the normal flow of life, Lord, we rely so much on our own human wisdom and, and even, Lord, the wisdom that we gleam from the world 
that just because everybody's doing that, that therefore it's okay for us to do it too. Lord, forgive us for our unfaithfulness in not looking to you and not seeking your counsel. Lord, help us to turn away from that and to, to make it our practice to first come to you and then, Lord, make a decision and not make a decision and then plead you to bless that. Lord, help us in that, I pray in Jesus' name. Amen.